Hello, this is Jill Marshall. I'm an author, editor, a manuscript professor, a publisher, and also your facilitator for the online workshop on how to write picture books. And what I'd like to do in this section here is just reconfirm the learning that you've just had and gone through in the PDF on the Three Little Pigs technique, which is a way of plotting any story, but it works particularly well for picture books to give you lots of rise and fall and lead you up to a very satisfying climax while also leaving a little um, space for a trick in the end, if you like, to just draw your reader back in again, just when they think they're going to close the book. So just to go over that Three Little Pig story, which I'm sure you know extremely well, but it might just help you to hear it one more time. So we start off with the Three Little Pigs living together in their mother's house or their father's house. Now, where a lot of these stories actually come from is social history, whereby, in this case, the third son would often have to go out and seek a living for himself, as he wouldn't be able to um, take over the family land or go into the clergy um, or sometimes the military. So often the third son would be off to seek their fortune. So that's where a lot of these fairy tales come from. And the Three Little Pigs is one of those. Go out, three sons, and seek your fortune. So the first little pig sets off, and with the tools and instruments he has to hand, he builds himself a house of straw. Now, obviously, we know that straw is not a terribly strong material, that it's not going to withstand anything terribly much, but it certainly won't stand up to the huffing and puffing of the wolf who comes along and blows that house down. So then the second little pig is joined by the first pig, depending on which version you know, or sometimes the second little pig is on his own, and he decides to use sticks and wood to build his house with, which is a more logical choice than the first little pig and his house of straw. And it might withstand a little bit more substance and challenges, but in this case, it doesn't. So he builds his house of sit, the wolf comes along, he huffs and he puffs, and he blows the house down. So that's two houses, now gone. And bear in mind that the second house was bigger and stronger than the first house. Then those first two little pigs either join the third pig or the third pig's there on his own. He thought about this a little bit more and decided what substances are going to protect him. And he built his house of bricks. Now, that logically should make sense. It should be able to withstand most onslaughts from the weather and the normal things that we have to stand up to. But, of course, what he is facing is far from normal. It's actually a long tooth slavering wolf. Now, the wolf comes along, and he huffs and he puffs. But in this case, he cannot blow the house down because it's made of bricks and because that little pig has been quite clever. And he's built something bigger and stronger and more substantial than the house of sticks, which in turn was bigger and stronger and more substantial than the house made of straw. So the wolf thinks about this and decides to climb up onto the roof and to head down the chimney. But in the meantime, the three little pigs have put their heads together. They've worked as a team. They've observed what challenges they've already had to overcome and learnt from that. And so they set up a boiling pot beneath the top of the chimney. Now, again, depending on which version you know, the wolf meets his grim end in the pot and becomes uh, lunch for the next few weeks, or possibly he just burns himself, uh, leaps out of the chimney and runs away, never to be seen again. In either case, or whatever variant of that you may know yourself, the wolf has been thwarted. So by putting their heads together, by working out what's gone wrong with their previous attempts to do things, the three little pigs have managed to defeat a big, strong enemy. And where do they all end up? In their brick house, which is going to look rather like Mum's brick house, I suspect. And they're all living together, happy ever after. And the end will look very much like the beginning. But in fact, everything has changed because now they've matured, they've overcome some challenges, and they've thought how to um, work as a team to overcome significant obstacles and challenges. So there's that ending that looks very much like the beginning, but in fact is substantially different. So this is our technique for plotting picture books, and it works all the time. I suggest you go out and have a look at some picture books, and a very good example is The Little Tractor by Joy Cowley, because it's um, you can see all of these techniques in that book used over and over. So the equivalent of I'll huff and I'll puff and I'll blow the house down, she uses in the phraseology about he's a good little tractor, a strong little tractor, a chugga chip, can't go wrong little tractor. So can you hear that same resonance again that really appeals to children? And then you have 
a tractor on a farm who's um, lonely, who wants to just serve the farmer that he works for um, and at the beginning, and then he somehow gets lost. And then there are three incidents, each increasing in size until there's a massive chimney event where he thinks all is lost completely, but then a farmer finds him. And at the end, he's back on a farm doing his good tractor service and it all looks very much like the beginning, but in fact he's with a different family. He's being used again properly, and he's very happy. So everything has changed throughout that story. And Joy Cowley used that same technique, uh, knowingly or not knowingly, I'm not sure. And uh, it could be unwittingly because this is such a familiar, familiar structure to all of us, from all our stories that we heard as children and that we've read to our own children. It's very inherent. And therefore, it really, really works for especially picture books, but all stories, in fact. So here's what you have. You have a beginning. And this will be a state of normality of some kind. In the case of the three little pigs, it's them all living together in their parents' house. And then you have a catalyst, something that sparks the story off, literally explodes the story in some circumstances. So sometimes it's actually called the bomb, the thing that explodes that story and galvanizes it into action. And then we have a peak of activity, one set of challenges put together and overcome somewhat, but they don't actually reach a satisfactory conclusion. In fact, they may take a little time out to just think about what went wrong and how they might do that better next time around. And then you have a second peak of activity, which is bigger than the first one, but is still not big enough to overcome all those obstacles, all those challenges that the characters are facing. And then you have a third peak of activity, bigger still than the first, second one, which was bigger than the first one. And although it's so much better and they're so much nearer to meeting their goal or overcoming that challenge, they're still not quite there. So this is very important. You must have that chimney event, the climax of the story, all going on within what I call the chimney. But really, it's the, it's the climax. It's where everything comes together and when your character realizes what they need to do in order to really reach out, move forward, deal with everything. And that can be from working out, if you're a tractor, how to get back into a family and working on a farm. If you're the Gruffalo, how to um, deal with monsters. And you can, I'm sure, think of a million examples of what happens in that climax. Um, and hopefully you'll be able to apply that now to your own story. Now, the thing also with um, picture books that the three peaks of activity assist you with is possibly thinking of the numbers and types of characters that you might have. So it's very possible to have a lead character who starts out the story, have the catalyst happen to them, and they will then possibly go on to meet three other characters, each increasing in size. And by size, I mean um, it can be physical size, it can be importance, it can be scariness, it can be ludicrousness, it can be whatever your story is about, but it happens in growing size, an increasing size. So you'll have one peak of activity, which maybe equates to a smaller animal. And then you may have another one that equates to a slightly bigger animal. And then you'll have a third that equates to a bigger animal still, but it's not the one that's going to deal with the whole story, because that's going to turn up in the climax. So you may go from having one lead character to then having another an additional four characters that are um, in the story, because they are your peaks of activity in your chimney. Does it have to be that way? By no means does it have to be that way, but that's sometimes just a useful little trick for helping you to work out how many characters you need and where they need to be and why. And that's because they're helping you construct the story as well. So in the example that I've used in the modules, you will see that I have used um, animals of increasing um, size in some respects, but actually what they're demonstrating is um, increasing scale of importance to Barney, to the boy, so he doesn't want to live in a cold, damp place. He doesn't want to be without his duvet, and um, he certainly doesn't want to have to live in somebody else's home. He wants to be with his own family, and that's when he spots the snail who carries his home around with him. And that's the important lesson for Barney, is that home is where the heart is. So just a little um, additional piece of information to do with character that might help you to structure your story as well. Do bear in mind, for picture books, a lot of publishers actually don't like animal characters. They particularly don't like talking animal characters. And if you're in New Zealand, they especially don't like iconic New Zealand talking characters. And that's just because they've been used a lot before. I think the trick is, again, if you're going to use talking animals, don't have them talking to humans, because that can um, confuse the young reader, the child in that point of your triangle. So 
if they're going to be talking animals, have them all, um, all talking animals, like Jill Murphy's elephants, who are really just a human family in elephant form. So I'm sure you're familiar with some of those. If not, go and find some Jill Murphy books and look at those lovely element, uh, elephant families within there. So your characters can be animals or they can be children, and they can also be adults if and only if they are quite childlike in themselves. So the children, particularly, don't like to read about adults who are adults unless they are in a very adult position, such as they are the teacher um, or they are the grandparent. Even stories about grandparents, which we all know of, that are picture books about wacky grannies and so on, those characters themselves are quite childlike. So that's the key to remembering how to establish your characters within that plotting structure for your picture book. So now you've seen it all, you can put it all together, you can have your beginning, your first peak of activity, your second peak of activity that's bigger than the first, your third peak of activity, your climax, and then your ending, which looks very much like the beginning, but is actually completely different. And then read on in your module to find out what can come next. Enjoy your plotting.